and good day. Thanks for joining us. It is a new year, a new year and a new outlook. It's our first show back with you live. I know last Wednesday was the first Wednesday of the year, but we wanted to spend time with family, and I hope you did too. We had a great new year. Um, I don't know if you made any of those New Year's resolutions. Our last show, we kind of talked about uh, um, happiness and what makes you happy uh, with when our show with Dan Schaefer as we were preparing for the holidays. And surprisingly enough, uh, Arthur Brooks and the American Inter- Enterprise Institute has a great video out, a speech that you should probably watch if you haven't seen it already, as well as um, some study and some research on what truly makes people happy. And surprisingly enough, it's really not wealth. It's not big events. Uh, he has it divided into percentage points. And the, the little bit that you have control over, I think, was family, community, work, and faith. And so I, I, I would recommend you go and do a search for, excuse me, for that video. And, and there was another one uh, David Ramsey had on his website, Healthy Habits, or, or yeah, how was it? Healthy Habits of Rich People. Or rich or habits rich people do. It lit off a firestorm. I never understood why it made so pe- so many people mad just to show the percentage of folks who make good income and what they do and how they spend their time versus those who have yet to make good income and how they spend their time. It wasn't an us against them, but some people tried to turn it into that. All that to say, it's a new year, a great time to turn over a new leaf and see what um, you might change in your life for the good couple of things I do need to tell you about, and we'll talk about them a little bit more at the end of the show, is um, Iowa caucuses are coming up. As you know, we're first in the nation, um, not just during presidential years, but we have our first, we have our nation's, our caucus here in the state uh, in this next month, January 21st. January 21st, we'll be meeting Democrats and Republicans will meet in their various buildings, various locations. If you want information, call your state party. If you're an independent, you'll have to register as one of those parties. And I think both now have same day registration, much to my chagrin. I don't mind a little planning and forethought as to what party you're going to participate in just to stop some of those shenanigans that I think take place in presidential year. But that's a side note. Call your county chair of your party or the party you desire to attend and find out where the location is. This is how you make a difference. It is necessary that you participate. You can go on and look at the platforms on each party's website your state party should have that information for you. You can call them, look them up on the online and get the numbers, call them or email. Talk to your friends and your family. But whatever you do, make sure that you stand on biblical principle, not because I'm going to push my faith on you, but because this was a nation founded on godly principles. That what, that's what set us apart. That is the exceptionalism that people talk about. And so I invite you to make sure that those planks, uh, to make sure that they're there. If, if they're not brought up by somebody else, write one up quickly that night. But you can go in and copy one off the existing platform and resubmit it because that whole platform is scrapped and redone anew. So don't take anything for granted that it's going to be there. You may want to put a new plank in. You may want to make sure that you reaffirm a plank that's existing. We have issues on Common Core. We have, we have model planks we can give you on that to stop Common Core. Uh, life planks, uh, marriage planks, and any more. I think we need some religious liberty planks, which is what we're going to be talking about today. I'm very pleased to have joining me Brian Fisher. Brian is with the American Family Association, and I'm sure you've probably heard of that group. Maybe you haven't. Uh, To me, they're kind of like the Billy Graham of organizations. They've they've been around for a while and just a good group of, of folks full of integrity and wisdom on the issues. Brian is the Director of Issue Analysis for Government and Public Policy at the American Family Association. He provides expertise on a range of public policy topics. Uh, He's described in the New York Times as a talk radio natural, and he hosts the Focal Point radio program on AFR Talk, which airs live each weekday, 1 to 3 p.m. Central Time on American Family Radio's nationwide talk network of 125 stations. Brian, thank you so much for taking time out and joining me today. 
Well, you're certainly uh, certainly welcome, Tamara. It's good to be on with you. Thank you. And I want to apologize to you in front of our listeners. I wanted to get you on a couple weeks ago. I was actually doing some other interviews as well and wanted to get you on one of those. And between the holidays and your schedule and my schedule and and your agency, we just couldn't seem to manage it. But thank you for taking time out to start the new year off with me today. You bet. Great way to start the new year. Glad to do it. And should we give a, 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 maybe it's called a hat tip or a shout out to your agency? Is it Hamilton Strategies that you all work with? Yes, Hamilton Strategies. Mike and Debbie over there, they do a fantastic job. So we're very pleased to work with them. And so if someone is not familiar with the American Family Association, what would you say? How would you um, describe what you do to them? Well, the American Family Association was formed in 1977 or 1978 by Don Wildman, who was primarily concerned at that time with decency issues in network broadcasting. He sat down one night with his family around Christmas looking for something family-friendly to watch on network television. Of course, at that time, there were just the three alphabet networks. Couldn't find anything that was suitable for family viewing. So that aroused in him a concern for the moral drift, the cultural drift in our culture. He brought the American Family Association in to being to provide some kind of antidote to that. And so our mission really ultimately is to return the United States of America to faith in Jesus Christ, to an adherence to the gospel, and to bring America back to the principles that animated the founders. They were animated by a recognition that the Creator, with a capital C, is the source of all of our unalienable rights, that the purpose of government is to secure those rights, not to give those rights, that the values that shaped America from the very beginning were the values that are enshrined in the Ten Commandments of God. And so our our purpose as an organization is to call America back to its founding principles. We believe there's a reason why America has been the greatest and the strongest and the freest and the most prosperous and most powerful nation in history, and it's because it began with an adherence to biblical principles, and we want to bring the nation back to that. You're absolutely right, and it's so irritating when I hear people say, don't push your, your values on me, or, or it, I speak on college campuses often, and you can see uh, in the students this resentment come over their face the moment you either quote a scripture or even forbid that you mention one of our founding fathers in a quote that one of them said that show any kind of faith or intent to uh, keep our laws, as you know, many of our laws were founded on biblical principle. And it's, there's just such a resentment within these students. And so then I often find myself explaining the ignorance of someone who may not understand that our country was founded on biblical principle. How do you handle it? I'm sure maybe more lovingly than I do. Well, you know, I, and I'm, I'm completely familiar with the dynamic that you're talking about there, Tamara. And the reality is, we're becoming increasingly polarized as a culture on these values issues. You know, it used to be, uh, even right through the 1960s until the early 1970s, both political parties, both conservatives and liberals, had there was a consensus about certain moral values. Sanctity of life was something that was honored. The sanctity of marriage was something that was honored. Uh, the fact that homosexual behavior was something that ought to merit society's disapproval rather than being celebrated. That was all sort of shared in common, but in the last 30 or 40 years now, we've seen increasingly those that hold the levers of political power in America do not believe in any kind of transcendent moral code or transcendent truth. And as you pointed out, they're not content to simply have a dialogue or debate about this. I mean, we're fine. You and I are fine talking with people about their point of view and debating them and discussing this and letting them make their case for their view, and then we make our case for our view, and then the listeners can sort of decide for themselves. We're we're fine with that, but there's an anger and a, a spirit of rebellion. You know, there's a, in the Old Testament, there was a sin that was called the sin of the high hand, referring to just kind of this defiance against God, a defiance against God's standard of right and wrong, sort of this willingness to shake your fist in the, in the face of God. And so that anger and that resentment is coming from the same place. So this has been a battle that has been taking place in, uh, in human civilization uh, since the dawn of time. And I think what's a little bit different in our day, in our time here in 2014, is to see the dangerous progress that those that do not believe in any kind of transcendent moral values, the progress that they have made, and when they gain political power, their goal is to marginalize and neutralize and silence 
people like you and me. They're not content to let us debate and, and have our point of view expressed. They want to marginalize us. They want to box us up. They want to set us aside. They want to remove us from the public square. And so that's what we're kind of up against. You know, we saw that with what the gay lobby tried to do to Phil Robertson, for instance, back before before Christmas. They didn't. They wanted to silence him. They wanted him fired. They wanted him gone. They wanted him off the airways. They uh, airwaves. They did not want him even to be in a position where he could communicate his views and his values to the American people. And so that's kind of what we're up against. And the real calling, I think, for us is to be uh, courageous. You know, I just read a passage this morning where Paul went into a town, uh, Antioch and Pisidia. He spoke the gospel. People started to contradict him. Powerful people started to contradict him and refute him and revile him. And Paul's response, rather than becoming silent, becoming intimidated, cowering in fear, the Bible says he spoke out boldly, and that's what we need to do. The same thing that Phil Robertson did. He just continued to speak out. He didn't retreat. He didn't back down. He stood up to the bullies of Big Gay, and they were the ones that wound up backing down. It was beautiful to see. He, w- he The difference is he was a man who knew what he believed. He was a man who was confident in God. And I also think that it helped that his family is able to work together at their um, um, business, and that helps, I think, grow that foundation in our families I hate it to see families uh, separated by by geographic uh, distance and and no, it seems like the entrepreneurship that we used to have is no longer available to so many and I think that's also hurting us as well. But it's, you're right. Phil Phil knew what he was. He he what he did not question. And because of that, because of that, his family was standing with him. And A and E, it was a beautiful sight to watch. A and E back down. It was a beautiful sight to watch the Cracker Barrel roll over. <laughs> you know that was funny to me too because Cracker Barrel, they probably have some guy they're paying one hundred and fifty thousand bucks, a PR guy to tell them how to manage these public relations events. And when this thing first broke, he must have gone to them in the panic, in a panic that you've got to distance yourself from Phil Robertson, you got to get away from those duck people as fast as you can. And so they kind of obediently listened. You know, on the statement they issued, we don't want to offend anybody. We're about inclusion and all that. But what they realized right away is they offended their core base. They sure did. go to Cracker Barrel after church on Sunday. So in their anxiety and their eagerness not to offend, they offended the only people that matter, and that is the people that they want to come into their stores and eat their food and and buy their products. So they... uh, That was the most abject corporate apology I've ever seen in my life. And I think what's significant to me is not just what Phil Robertson said, because he simply spoke biblical truth. He said homosexual behavior is unnatural. He said there is a God who one day is going to judge us all. That's why the gospel is important. The shed blood of Jesus Christ is important. But what was more important to me is what he did after he was criticized. He did not back down. That was was significant, not just what he said, but how he responded when he was blistered and lacerated by the homosexual lobby. He did not retreat one square inch. And as you pointed out, I think it was very, very important that his family stood together with him. They were united. This show is not going to go on without Phil Robertson. It's a take it or leave it proposition. A&E said, look, this is the golden goose that's laying the golden eggs. We're just about ready to cut the head off of that goose. That's a bad idea. It's a stupid idea from a business standpoint as well as being wrong morally. So it it was gratifying to see the retreat there. And I think Phil Robertson's example could embolden a lot of other ordinary people. This is a guy that makes duck calls for a living. He's an ordinary guy. And yet he spoke the truth. He refused to back down. And I think that could galvanize a lot of ordinary Americans who believe what he believes, believes what you and I believe, to simply speak their mind. Well, I'm not talking about being obnoxious or belligerent, but just being Uh, just being outspoken and being vocal about our values and refusing to retreat when we get challenged on them. Because, as Phil Robertson pointed out, if if people have an issue with what he said about homosexuality, their issue is really not with him. Their issue is with God. God's the one that created human beings. He's the one that created our sexuality. He's the one that designed it to be expressed in marriage. So Phil said, look, your problem's not with me. It's with God. And and, uh, he he wound up being vindicated in this this, uh, fracas. 
You're absolutely right. And you bring up the image of whoever the marketing person was at Cracker Barrel. And perhaps, I don't know if you you watched the movie Miracle on 34th Street. It's something we watch every year. And I guess maybe I see that person twisting their eyebrow as the psychiatrist in the, in the movie after after they made the decision and figured out what a blunder they had done. But that's what happens when we follow man. And that was that's also what, what Phil's strength was. He doesn't look to the approval of man. Uh, the New Testament talks about how people would have followed, they saw Jesus, they believed, but they were they were not of courage enough in the synagogues because well you know jesus said at one point woe to you when all men speak well of you it says in other words if everybody is saying nice things about you that means at some point you're pulling your punches you're not you're not defending your convictions because if you take a stand for the truth you are going to uh, arouse opposition and hostility from people who hate the truth you know i often say that uh, the truth is not hate speech no. The truth is only hate speech to people who hate the truth. That's right. And if you speak the truth, there are people who are going to hate you uh, for that, and that becomes a test of your character and your courage. And do you really believe what you claim you believe? Do you really believe that these standards that are found in the Judeo-Christian are, uh, tradition are true for all people at all times? Well, if you believe it, if you're not just paying lip service to that, then you're going to stick to that no matter what kind of resistance you get. And Galatians tells us, have I, become your, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And, mm-hmm. and that's where we're at today. And, and I'll, I'll leave Cracker Barrel alone after this, but I did tweet out immediately that um, they, their, their letter was that we're people pleasers, and I tweeted out that they've become bully appeasers, not people pleasers. Yeah. And that's what this whole well, thing was about. Yeah, and I think, you know, they, they always accuse us of being the ones that are bullies and the bigots and intolerant. I think the intolerance and the bullying and the bigotry is coming from the homosexual lobby. They're the ones that are intolerant of any contrary uh, point of view. They're the ones that tried to bully Phil Robertson right off the show, and, and they're consistently the ones that try to bully people into silence and intimidation. They're the real bullies on the playground, and Phil Robertson stood up to them, and they backed down. You're absolutely right that they're the bullies, and it's not just with Phil Robertson. It's with organizations and businesses throughout the country, throughout the states, and so that's why it was so fitting to have American Family as my guest today. Um, American Family Association, you were talking about being intolerant. I think, aren't you deemed a hate group? (laughs) Well, you know, and we have been classified as a hate group, and the reason we've been classified as a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center is simply because we tell the truth about homosexuality. We tell the truth about marriage and God's design for marriage, and people who hate the truth are going to classify us as a hate group. But we're not a hate group. We're a truth group. We love everybody. We love even homosexuals enough to tell them the truth about the risks of homosexual behavior, and we will continue to do so. Now, we're going to have to take a break here, but when we come back, and I hope you can stay on with us, when we come back, I want to talk, you you're talking about 40 years ago, Don Wildman was concerned about the lack of, of variety and availability of a good TV show. Wow. Zoom forward to today. When I turn on my TV, it not only uh, is distasteful, it frightens me. I'm an adult, and it frightens me. Most of the shows today, it's beyond inappropriate. It is witchcraft. It is spells. It is transcendental, supernatural behavior. Uh, very violent in nature. I love a good thriller. I love uh, being able to think my way through. But these shows that are on today, are they're, they're undermining a whole new message. And, Brian, I don't think it's any consequence that much of what we're dealing with today is uh, not an improvement over what we had 40 years ago when it was about 40 to 50 years ago when we took prayer and Bible out of the school. When we come back, let's talk about that. And we're going to go to a break right now. We are powered by webcast1live.com. I am Tamara Scott with Truth For Our Time. We help you when the headlines hit home, uh, how to live uh, God's Word, because if He expects you to live through it, He's directed you how to do it. And so stay tuned. We'll be right back after these messages. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. I'm Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just I, I don't think that you can fake it. 
and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you gonna say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna wanna know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it, because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now, and then leave, and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me but is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did was perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm gonna take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed right or it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. And I am Tamara Scott. This is Truth For Our Time. Thanks for staying with us. We're talking with Brian Fisher from American Family Association. We're discussing uh, the Duck Dynasty, uh, Phil Robertson ruffle that took place over the holidays. And, you know, some people think that uh, the, the, the whole interview was staged. They had a representative from A&E there and certainly could have stopped Phil or stopped the interview should have something uh, not been pleasing, but they didn't. And so they felt like he was allowed to go on in hopes that it would cause such a ruckus and then they could come down on him in the manner that they did and scare him into retreat and therefore get control over what he would say or didn't say. Well, that greatly backfired. And as you know, uh, they rolled over, Cracker Barrel rolled over, and we're thrilled that he's back on the air. Although I have to tell you, I was hoping he would never be back on a &E again. I was hoping that he would refuse, the whole family would refuse, A&E would drop them, and they would go to some obscure channel, whether it was the outdoor door cable channel, whatever it was, and that they would kick tail feathers in the ratings, and A&E would be the sad loser in the deal. But it didn't work out that way. We, we were not surprised. We know what A&E was to begin with. And uh, I guess the good in all of this, Brian, I don't know how you feel, but I, I think the good in this, the, the, the real fright was that they were willing to put this ideology ahead of, of their own greed because Duck Dynasty is such a an income for that channel, taking them from... Well, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad that it's worked out. I mean, I understand the difference in point of view and all that, and I think they would have gone to another network, but, you know, they've got a platform now on A&E, and this is a network that is watched by a lot of people that may not necessarily be churchgoers. They True. watch it because it's entertaining, it's humorous, it's fun. And it's clean. It's family friendly. They don't have to worry about what their kids are going to be exposed to on that program. And it's the most popular cable television program in history. And this is only going to increase attention to the program. And the family has made it very clear to A&A, look, our faith, our faith in Jesus Christ, our prayer at the end of every meal or at the beginning of every meal, at the end of every show, that's central to who we are as a family. And we're not going to do the show unless we are allowed to be who we are and display our faith in the way that we, we customarily do. And 
it was clear to A and E from the very beginning. I mean, Phil Robertson made it clear to them, look, you're, you're not going to cut the name of Jesus Christ out of our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name, and you want us on this program. You want it to continue. You're going to need to include that because that's who we are. We pray in Jesus' name because that's the way our rabbi uh, taught us to pray. You know, Jesus Christ taught us to pray. And so, I, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of delicious how this has worked out <laughs> because now you've got the most popular television show and in cable history is going to get ready to start a brand new season. Phil's going to be in this season, and this can't hurt, can't possibly hurt ratings, which means more and more people now are going to be exposed every week to what a healthy family looks like and what family values really look like uh, in action. So I think it's a tremendous win. You know, we had one other thing that happened a lot of people don't know about, Tamara. We weighed in on this at, at, at AFA. The Rose Parade took place, obviously, on January 1, and, and one of the events that was supposed to be a featured event at the Rose Parade was the marriage of two homosexuals in the middle of the parade. They were going to be on a float. Float was going to go through, and when they got to kind of the viewing stand and all that, they were going to have a clergyman perform this gay wedding. They had a lottery to see who was going to be the lucky couple to be get this, uh, you know, what, what I consider a counterfeit marriage performed. And so the homosexual lobby was building this up. This is going to be great. It's going to be on national TV. Well, we and a number of other pro-family organizations, we encourage people on our network, look, contact the chairman of the Rose Parade and say, look, you find this offensive. You know, you're going to have, you, this is a family-friendly event. You want to be able to watch the Rose Parade with your children without having to answer very awkward questions about what two men are doing kissing on a float. And we object to this. And what happened is the uh, networks cut away from the actual gay marriage ceremony. Both ABC and NBC did it. Local affiliates did to make sure even the HGTV, which is, I guess, the home shopping channel, they cut away from it. So once again, it's sort of an indication that I do, I, I just honestly do not think that the vast majority of the American people are walking in sync with the homosexual lobby. It turns out they're the ones that are on the fringe. That was clear with the A&E and the Cracker Barrel thing. It's clear now with what the Rose Parade decided to do with this gay marriage ceremony. You know, we, we're the mainstream Americans. We believe the values that have that that mainstream Americans have always believed and that made this country great. It's really the homosexual lobby that's out there on, on the fringe. And I think the fact you got a guy like Phil standing tall and strong is going to encourage people to now be vocal themselves. And people are going to start to realize, hey, I think we've miscalibrated where the American people are at on the whole homosexual lobby and same-sex marriage. And folks, let me encourage you. If Phil Robertson and A&E heard you. Understand your politicians and your elected officials will hear you as well. If there's one thing that politicians can do, it is count well. They hear, they hear their voters and which way the wind is blowing. And unfortunately, many of them are political wind socks, but all the more reason for you to give them some direction. And I only wish we had politicians with a little bit of integrity like Phil had with a willing to stand in the same strength that this duck hunter was able to stand. Imagine what we would do, Brian. I think we'd see changes all over. I think if, if people would remember, uh, Romney may have lost in certain states, but where those marriage marriage was up in those states, they marriage beat Romney in a couple of those states. So that's for another day. I don't want to get sidetracked. I want to come back to the TV, but I'd I want to make that point to listeners. Um, make yourselves known. You can get results if you'll make yourself be heard. Ronald Reagan said the winners show up. We were talking just briefly before we went to the air about the TV. Your organization has been around since 78. If people don't get your emails, your alerts, how could they sign up for those, Brian? Well, they can go to afa.net, afa.net. You'll see a button for our action alerts in the upper right-hand corner of the front page. We're retooling our website, so maybe they've moved that. It's, I think it's just going online today. And I haven't seen it yet, but there'll be a button there for action alerts. And what we do, Tamara, we communicate with everybody on our email network. It's from a million to two million strong now, one or two times a week on an issue that we know is going to be important to values-driven people. Give them an opportunity to weigh in, to make their voice heard, just like you uh, were saying. Politicians, they count the number of phone calls. They count the number of emails. Trust me on this. And we believe we want to make it as easy as possible for our politicians to do the right thing. And the way we do that is by letting their voices be heard. AFA.net, sign up for our action alerts, and you can be part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. 
Absolutely. And if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. <laughs> and so let's talk a little bit more about this religious liberty, because it's not just Phil. This was not an isolated incident. Phil just happened to be um, the one that came to our attention because he's so visible. I have in my hand uh, lifenews.com. The Hobby Lobby CEO pins a tragic letter about the loss of religious freedom. We have a cake decorator here in Huxley, Iowa, that faced charges because she simply very kindly told a a same-sex or homosexual couple that she would not be comfortable doing their wedding cake, but she gave them the name of three others who would. We have a couple who uh, own a a former church building, beautiful little church building, and it's a a restaurant-type, reception-type art gallery, and they're being uh, threatened with charges or a lawsuit because they simply said, thank you, no, we don't think we can take this business. We think you might be better aptly suited in another venue. Do Americans not have the ability to refuse business any longer? Even if they're going to take the financial hit, it's not a, it's not a hit to someone else. It's their loss. Well, and I think what you're seeing there, Taryn, what you're illustrating is one of the things, I mean, it, it is religious liberty. That's the most important thing. These people's First Amendment rights to the free exercise of religion, their First Amendment rights to freedom of association, uh, those are under grave assault right now, and the examples you mentioned are sort of exhibits A, B, and C in that in that whole dynamic. But what this exposes is the lie of the left, because what the left has always said when it comes to same-sex marriage, all we want is the freedom to marry. That's all we want. We don't want to tell you what to do, but we don't want you to tell us what to do. We just want to get married. We just want to be left alone. But now we realize that's a complete lie. They're not just content with having the freedom to marry. Now they want to compel everybody in the culture to agree with them, to endorse these marriages, to support them, to sanction them. And if somebody won't, then the left wants to punish them, put them out of business, even put them in jail. You know, you've got this case, I'm sure you've been following Tamara down in Colorado, very similar to the situations you're describing in Iowa, where he's a baker. Uh, homosexual couple. You can't even get married if you're a same-sex couple in Colorado. It's illegal there. So they've gone to Massachusetts, had gotten married. They came back to Colorado, wanted to have some kind of a reception to celebrate. And this baker, very kindly, just as you pointed out, it wasn't hateful or, or, or hostile or anything. He just politely declined, and they got somebody else to do it. But they were not content with that. They said, no, you have to bake a cake for our ceremony. And he is now in danger of going to jail. He may be sent to jail simply for exercising his First Amendment right to the free exercise of religion. And I think that's what's important to understand, Tamara. What we're talking about here is what the First Amendment protects, which is the free exercise of religion. Government has no right to infringe in your life if you are exercising your genuinely held religious convictions. And that's not just something for one hour a week. That's what President Obama wants people to think, that the First Amendment is about the freedom of worship. It's not. It includes that. But it's as if the left wants you to think that all the Constitution guarantees is your right to do whatever you want in your church building from 11 to noon on Sundays. It does not. It protects the free exercise of religion. So you can exercise your religious convictions seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. And that's really what's at stake when you have these vendors, these marriage reception vendors, when you have the left cracking down on them, trying to penalize them, punish them, even throw them in jail, simply for exercising their First Amendment rights. And it's not that we're intolerant. We simply want equal footing to be able to tell the truth. There are doctors who can no longer tell the truth. They'll be scrutinized if not punished. Workers are not allowed to speak the truth in their workplaces without having to go through sensitivity training, the threat of not getting a promotion, being depromoted, and possibly fired. Students are not allowed to speak the truth in the classroom. They will be uh, given a, 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 a detention and possibly face some sort of, of repercussion in the classroom as well. Should they, and we, we have links and stories to students who have been kicked out in the upper levels, the upper education, uh, secondary education, of, of, of programs and, and uh, not allowed to participate because of their religious beliefs. Christians are under attack. And, in fact, I just tried to tweet her out before we went on air. I had the perfect tweet. It was exactly the right characters. I wasn't over. I was perfectly at zero. And this air, um, I get this message. There was an error posting your message. It is forbidden. 
is forbidden. It was forbidden. That's what it says. Like, uh, do, you, do you know, was it banned for content? I don't know. I'm going to have to look that out when I have more time. Uh, I'm clicking on the well, help yeah, center. What, it could what, be because what, I had that nasty American Family Association and Brian Fisher <laughs> mentioned in there. Well, that, that, that could be it. <laughs> but you know what this illustrates is that um, you know, I refer to people on the left as secular theocrats. They always accuse of, uh, us of wanting to establish the theocracy. We do not. We believe in a constitutional republic. We believe that everybody ought to be able to defend and vocalize their values and then we have a means, we have a political means through the, the political process, votes and ballots and campaigns and all that. We've got a, a means by which we decide which of these values we are going to protect in our public policy. We believe in that. That's freedom. That's freedom of speech. It puts power in the hands of the people, just as our Constitution enshrines. And so they accuse us of being theocrats. We're not. We're not out to impose our will on anybody. We believe in the democratic process. But the left, that's why I call them secular theocrats, they are interested, they are eager, they are committed to imposing their values on us and punishing us if we uh, disagree. And I think it's important to understand, particularly when it comes to the homosexual lobby, we need to understand that every advance of the homosexual agenda comes at the expense of religious liberty. Every advance of the homosexual agenda comes at the expense of religious liberty. Religious liberty must retreat every time the homosexual agenda advances. It is a zero-sum game. And I think Christians for too long have sort of been asleep at the switch here. We've kind of believed, well, if we just tolerate, we just capitulate, we just make concessions, you know, we can all get along. Well, that that's simply not the case. And, you know, the examples that you gave, Tamara, about what's going on there in Iowa make it very, very clear. No, they are not interested in tolerance. They're not interested in in diversity. If they were, they would celebrate uh, cake makers that have a different point of view, they would think, hey, isn't this wonderful? Isn't America great? No matter what you believe, you can be in business and you can exercise those principles. Well, they don't believe that. You know, they want to put these people in jail or fine them or put them out of business. And so what we what we realize is, uh, you know, religious liberty is precious. It's the most important liberty for the that the founders wanted to protect right off the bat, the very first liberty and right they protected was the free exercise of religion. And we, you're exactly right. That's under severe assault right now. And the people of America that, that share our values, we need we need to stand up and, and be counted and make our voice heard. And let me make it clear to those of you who may be listening, it's not just people who are vocal like Phil Roberts, Robertson. It's a pastor in his church here in Des Moines. Could say anything he wanted inside, but when he put it on the, on the sign outside, it was a brouhaha. And the local police department was told they could not offer off-duty police uh, security. They were not allowed by someone wow. in the police department to protect this man. It ended, up, it ended up being to his advantage. He had that police coverage because they were close by. He ended up not having to pay for it because they, they were not allowed to be under his uh, 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 contract. So it worked out in his benefit. But this is what we're seeing, whether it's the florist in west on the west coast the the um uh the photographer in new mexico the bed and breakfast in the eastern coast and i'll tell you what i served i had the honor of being appointed to the u.s commission on civil rights for the state advisory code here in iowa and one of the things i kept bringing up was this issue it was for students teachers and parents in public schools who were being discriminated against and guess who wasn't invited back Mm. not only that i got a letter that said, now that it's become apparent that you're a Christian, you may respond and show us how you might still be beneficial on this committee. Wow. Well, and you know, we had this case in Oregon. Again, it was with a baker. Same deal, refused to bake a cake for this gay wedding uh, celebration. And the, the labor commissioner, this is a political figure. He heads up one of the major agencies in Oregon, so he's speaking for the government. He said, these people need to be rehabilitated. You know, and you start thinking about rehabilitation, re-education. I mean, that reminds you of communist China, reminds you of communist Russia, reminds you of communist Vietnam. I was in Vietnam a number of years ago, and my guide in the South, his father was a policeman in Saigon when it fell to the North Vietnamese. And the North Vietnamese just whisked him away for two years and sent him off to a re-education camp to get rehabilitated, to get his mind right 
on a political worldview. And see, that's exactly what you're looking at. When you get bounced off a civil rights commission, right. I mean, we're the ones that believe in the full range of civil rights. We want everybody's constitutional rights to be protected, freedom of speech, association, but particularly freedom of religion. And if you're punished on the basis of your religious point of view, that's unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination, and you, you've been a victim of it uh, yourself. I have been, and Liberty Council was great in representing me on that, and I'm not sure we're done with this yet. But uh, I, I want our listeners to understand, they'll come after you. Uh, we've even heard in some cases where if you were silent, that's seen as uh, opposition, and that too can be punishable. So it's not so much, well, no, go ahead. Yeah, and that was in the military too. That's what's significant, Tamara, that that was in a military presentation that if you are silent when the subject of gays in the military or same-sex marriage comes up, your silence will be taken as disapproval. So the mandate there is that you can't even keep your opinion to yourself. You are ordered, mandated, directed to publicly affirm what we consider to be a sexual deviancy. I mean, in our whole history as a republic, Homosexual conduct was always referred to as the infamous crime against nature. That's the way it was defined in law, an infamous crime against nature. And now, if you're not willing to say that this is good, it's wonderful, it's a perfectly acceptable alternative, if you're not willing to vocalize that and verbalize that, then you are the one now that is being punished. Absolutely, and we're seeing that time and again. So for those of you who are wondering what you can do, uh, whether I said, like I said, the caucuses that are coming up in Iowa, the planks to your parties, calling your legislators and asking them to submit some type of a um, uh, bill for religious liberty, to protect religious liberty. Yes, it's a First Amendment right, but it's high time that we either have some resolutions or some protections for it, something that we should be considering doing. And Brian, as you mentioned at the beginning of this show, it is our Christian foundation. It is our heritage. Uh, we were reading Revelations last week in church and talking about the two churches that uh, Jesus would would not be angry with, the church of Smyrna and the church of uh, um, Philadelphia. And it reminded me, you know what? Philadelphia, Philadelphia, the first city in which we talk about as far as our founding fathers named not just for brotherly love, the whole thing comes out of the Bible of Revelation. So what do we do to, to do now? Separate that church and state, and we can no longer name that city Philadelphia? Do we have to have a name change? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and you know, you talk about the separation of church and state, and I actually believe in the same separation of church and state that Thomas Jefferson believed in. His words have been twisted and distorted and turned upside down, what Thomas Jefferson meant when he said that the Constitution erects a wall of separation between the church and the state, what he meant by that is there is a wall that protects the church from the interference of the state. He wasn't talking about protecting the state from the influence of the church, which is what people today take it to mean. He said, look, the Constitution prohibits government from telling churches or Christians what they can and cannot do, what they can and cannot believe. It prohibits government from interfering in the way that they run their businesses. There is a wall that separates the reach of the government from meddling with the affairs of the church and with the followers of Christ. And that wall, as you know, we're talking about here today, that's been breached repeatedly. That wall has almost been torn down by the angry forces on the left. And it's time for us to rebuild it. It's always more difficult to take back the mountain than it is to simply hang on to it. But that's where we find ourselves. It is time for us to retake the culture. And I agree as well, Brian, on the separation of church and state. I also appreciate what God instructed us on the separation of church and state. It's very clearly in the Bible, not the one that's misrepresented and not found in the Constitution, but the separation of church and state that God speaks about, that government is only to punish the bad and uphold the good. Instead, we have government outside its bounds, acting outside its authority, and yet we wonder why these programs are not blessed. You cannot bless what is outside God's authority. They will always have uh, fraud and ex excess and inefficiencies in our welfare and in our charities. Those are to us as Christians, not as the civic-minded citizens. 
that's the tax, that's the tithe dollar, not the tax dollar. And as till we get that right, the church can't be blessed because it's not doing what it should be doing as fully as it could be blessed, and the government can't be blessed because it's outside of its bounds. Brian, I know I've kept you past your time. I thank you for staying with me. Do you have anything you'd like to share with our listeners in closing? Well, just, uh, you know, whatever you think about separation of church and state, it's impossible in America for there ever to be a separation between God and government, because our government was founded on a religious concept, the platform for our entire culture grounded on the concept that there is a creator with a capital C. He is the source of our unalienable rights, and the purpose of government is to protect the rights that God has given to us. So you never can, in America, separate God from government. And again, encourage uh, folks tomorrow to go to our website, afa.net, sign up for our action alerts, and we'll help you be involved in making your voice heard with decision makers. Thank you so much. And if you'll stay online, I want to talk to you just quickly during the, the break. But to our listeners... Uh, Join us. Stay with us. We'll be back with Allison Howard. She's with Concerned Women for America, the nation's largest women's public policy organization. She was on Sean Hannity last night or a couple of nights ago and did a great, great job. But we'll talk to her. What is this younger generation thinking about some of the things we've talked about here today? Stay tuned to Mara Scott Live with Truth For Our Time. We're powered by webcastonelive.com. Hey, psst. Let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open, honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart, and it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car, everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you and tell them Max sent you. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations, change your life, change your relationships transform your world. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Consumer Credit! Yeah! And thanks for joining us. That was Brian Fisher from the American Family Association. You can check them out at afa.net, American Family Association. These things that we're talking about, you need to understand. Uh, it may be somebody else in the media and the headlines right now, but they will come after you as well. You will be made to care is what people are saying. Joining me now is Allison Howard. Allison is with Concerned Women for America, the nation's largest public policy organization in the nation. And she is doing a great work. Uh, I actually got to see her on the Hannity show. I actually watched it online, but what a great representation she is of this upcoming generation. Alice, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Samara. I hope you're doing well out there. I am. And, um, so appreciate what you do for us. We were thrilled to have you in Iowa about the time of our state fair and at our summit, the leadership, uh, the family leader had their leadership summit and you and Penny Nance came out. But I want to talk to you today about uh, what we're seeing in the media, what we're seeing in the bias. We we just had a discussion with Brian Fisher. What is your generation, what is the younger generation looking at when they see this hostility towards anyone with a Christian value? That's a great question, man. Honestly, I'm thankful to be asked it, just because as long as I'm asked what millennials think, I know I'm, I'm still young. <laughs> I'm still considered a young person. Anybody who got um, to see you on Sean Hannity can tell how young you are <laughs> and what a great job you did. Thank you for, for uh, representing well, us. 
As soon as I get, uh, when I stop getting asked about what millennials think, I'll have to, I guess, reconsider uh, where I stand. But, um, you know, I think it's pretty neat the new year came up. I see all my friends posting about their uh, New Year's resolutions and, and what 2014 will hold. And I was asked on Hannity, like you said, what 2014, what my predictions were. And I think this year might be a big year of a millennial revolt of sorts. I mean, we're starting to see young people my age, I'm 25, just turned 25 New Year's Day, actually. And um, we're starting to see kind of the, the bill of goods we've been sold. There's a new poll out that uh, was done by the Harvard University Institute of Politics. And it says that young Americans are turning on what you would think we, we believe. You're told that we're all liberal, we're all progressive, especially us young women. And it's just not true. Uh, showing 41% of millennials approving of the job President Obama is doing. That's only 41%. 54% are disapproving. And a meager 38% approve of Obamacare. And guess what, Tamara? I'm sure you've talked about it on your show, but that's because this weighs so heavily on the backs of young people at a time when um, our unemployment rates have never been higher. It's harder for us to get a job, regardless of whether you have a degree or not. We're starting to see that for the first time in American history, our parents are saying that they don't believe we will have the same chance at success as they did. Um, and that's, that's sad. That's disheartening. And so for us to just be graduating college and starting to look for, for a career, not just a job, a career, to analyze for ourselves what works, big government or a limited government, is are the handouts helping us? And I I strongly say no, and I'm glad to see so many are thinking that same way. But, you know, your listeners and people um, all across the country are seeing the administration kind of pander to us, and I'm sure they've seen that through Pajama Boy and The Life of Julia. We saw that big time um, this year and just in 2013 in review. And, you know, I think people are smart. We're educated. We are some of the uh, most generous uh we're one of the most generous generations with our giving, but we are also one of the, uh, we crave transparency and we crave accountability. So just to be able to know now um, this NSA situation, now we know. Uh, things like Benghazi happening, now we know. We are, we are read up. We are always online. We are constantly getting informed. And I think that's a good thing. A good thing about my generation is we are, we are, um, we are quick to, to dig into what, the real story is. Absolutely. And so what would you say to someone who is listening? To me, you're giving me great hope. You're giving me great encouragement uh, because I know folks in my generation, and and I'm not even sure what generation that is. I think I'm still a baby boomer. But um, my generation and and some of those who have just come into the fight, some of the Tea Parties who are relatively new to the battle Mm -hmm. are already weary from the battle and showing signs of, of where and, and discouragement. So, so you're giving me encouragement. But what would you say to those of us in the battle? Sure. Well, I think that you guys are, have led the charge, and that's so huge for us as young people to have positive, winsome personalities at the front of this, so that we um, can better understand our philosophies and what this this battle, as you said should look like. And so to stay encouraged, because you are on the front line, you are going to take hits. But you have to know that there are young people behind you ready and looking how we can bolster the effort, we can bolster the movement, and continue to press forward. And that, to me, comes across best when it's in a a positive, winsome way. And the question I think everyone's asking is, will conservatives be able to come around and offer us as young people and the country positive, uplifting solutions. So they have to upward, uh, emphasize things like upward mobility. You, you've got to get this generation out of their parents' basements. There is a record number of young people moving back in with their parents, and there's nothing wrong with that. But we have to encourage upward mobility just for the good of them and for our, our country, our economy. Can we offer positive solutions about those opportunities, about personal liberties, job creation, um, and really how to reform this over-intrusive federal government. So it's easy for me to mock Pajama Boy and and Julia, but the real test is whether conservatives like yourself and all those campaigns that we'll be working on in 2014 are going to travel to the colleges, go to the universities, go to the inner cities with these specific solutions, addressing things that are very real to us, 
you know, student loan debt, free market health care alternatives, the, the proper role and oversight of government surveillance programs, you're going to find that there's a lot of young people ready to hear that now, um, as well as stuff like the private sector job creation uh, and how that actually works out. Because I think you'll find this interesting, and I hope this encourages you guys more. Uh, the same Harvard Institute of Politics survey I, I uh, talked about a second ago says that 33% of millennials consider themselves Democrats, 24% call themselves Republicans, and 41% label themselves independent. And I want to focus on that. 41% of millennials polled label themselves independent. That's an opportunity for conservatives to talk to them. You know, it, I was surprised to see such a small number associated with each party. There's so many there that are really willing and, and ready to weigh the option. So the question is, are those on the front line, are conservatives going to, to come up with this positive, winsome reform and, and win over these, these young people who are, who are seeing the problems with big government and ready to hear how we fix that and, and what the alternative is? And in just maybe 30 seconds, would, do we have to give in on the, on the issues of, of homosexuality? the Phil Robertson issues, will we win this younger millennial generation or do we have to give in our principles? Oh, absolutely stand strong. I think that that's something that uh, this, this, this young generation needs to see is consistency and uh, legitimate reasoning and logic. And those two issues for us are non-negotiable. You know, even those who may not agree on all points of the homosexuality issue and life issue, can respect the science and the reasoning behind having those stances. So I was really encouraged just to hear of, um, you know, Rince Priebus deciding to allow uh, RNC members to come to the March for Life. We're going to be there. I'll be at the March for Life this year. That is strongly, and I know you've been before and you're coming up this year, that's a young people movement. There are more young people there than old, maybe just because it's really cold and we're ready to weather the storm. <laughs> I'm not sure. But, you know, in the middle of January, you've got hundreds of thousands of young people marching on the mall, standing up for those who can't speak for themselves. That's huge. Um, in the movement on marriage, you're seeing a lot of young people standing up and saying, hey, listen, this is not about hate. This is about true love. And I've seen what being in a home without a mom and a dad does to a kid, and every kid deserves that. we got to strive for the ideal. You know, we don't have to redefine marriage. We have to reaffirm marriage. And, and that starts in every home that's listening right now, and it starts and will continue with young people standing up and saying, we've been the generation that lived through divorce and that lived through cohabitation. And right now I'm seeing my, my um, people my age have, you know, giving birth to children out of wedlock. The rate is now over 42% of children born in this country are born out of wedlock. And, and you know what that sets up for people in single parent homes and for those women and those men. So let's stand up. Let's speak the truth in love. That's how you start um, encouraging and continuing to, to, to explain our conservative principles to people all around you. Allison Howard has been my guest. She's a communications director at Concerned Women for America, the nation's largest public policy organization. You can find them at cwfa.org. And I thank Allison for joining us today. In the studio, we have just a couple minutes left, but I want to squeeze this in because our caucuses are coming up January 21st right here in Iowa. Heather Stansel has been the chair at her county caucus or your precinct, precinct precinct caucus. Mm -hmm. And so to figure out how it all happens, it's not that difficult. Heather, uh, how much time will it take for people to come? Well, I ran my caucus in an hour, which is about average. Sometimes they go a little longer. They rarely go shorter. But basically, it is a very simple process. It's more than just going in and voting for your candidate. After the voting, what you usually do is you divide up into groups of precincts. If there's multiple precincts meeting in um, one location. One location, which happened in, in my town. Um, and then you basically pick, you discuss planks. You write uh, the how what the party is going to stand for. 
going on through that doesn't come from Washington. No, that does not come it from comes Washington. From us. It does not come from the um, RNC chair or the Democrat chair. It comes from the grassroots. So when you start at the bottom, you can actually write what you want your party to stand for. And that all that stuff that we have now in the Republican Party planks were devised by the grassroots, you and I. And we have one of the strongest conservative platforms we've ever had. Right. And that came from us. And so don't be discouraged. Now is not the time to give up. The heat of the battle is not the time to crawl on the bunker. That's exactly right. And what we need is is the young gal that was just on the phone. We need more young people to breathe life into these caucuses. We need someone to pass the torch to, to take on and write these planks and stand for conservative values because that is the only way things are going to change and get better. You're absolutely right. And so there are a couple of different points I want to come back to, but we're out of time. It always flies by so quickly. We'll have to have Allison Howard back if she can come back and join us and talk about some of those opportunities for us in the entrepreneurial world and the business openings for kids and the education bubble that I think is the next to burst. Heather Stansel, thank you for popping in at the end of this show and we're going to see Heather shortly. We're, we're taping for uh, another show as I'm in Israel coming up here shortly, but we'll be talking about Common Course. And for those of you who are listening in and that's your bailiwick, get ready to call in. Uh, the discussion will be open. I am Tamara Scott. Thanks for spending this time with us. Your time is precious and I do not uh, take it for granted that you spend it with us. Uh, be encouraged and never be complacent. This is Truth For Our Time powered by webcast1live.com.